get your popcorn or chips or other snacks ready because today I'm bringing you some juicy real life stories. And why don't you comment down below what your favorite snack is when you watch a movie. Mine is chips, love chips, I always say that. Hey everyone, welcome back to Most Amazing Top 10 and welcome to today's video. I'm your host, Lindsay Ivan, and today I'm bringing you top 10 real stories that should be turned into movies part two. If you haven't already, I suggest you also watch part one. And like I said in part one, if you end up using my ideas, you know, feel free to hire me as an actress or uh, give me a share of that money. Starting off at number 10, we have The Exorcism. Now, I know that there are tons of exorcism movies out there, but this next one, it needs to be made into a movie for sure. Let me explain. So a family in North London claimed that their 26 year old son was a victim of possession. In August of 2016, they claimed that their son Kennedy Ife started to act more violent. He would say that a snake was living inside of him. He bit his father and he threatened to harm himself. This is when they restrained him to his bed. They then proceeded to conduct an exorcism on Kennedy. The family was very convinced that a demon was inside of Kennedy and that's what Kennedy referred to as the snake in his body. They left Kennedy strapped to the bed for three days without any medical attention. For those three days, they would just pray continuously. However, this sadly didn't work. He ended up developing breathing issues and passed away. When police arrived, they found that the family had tried to resurrect Kennedy from the dead. All seven members of the Ives family were convicted of manslaughter and false imprisonment. However, they were all cleared of charges in March of 2019. So was Kennedy really possessed or did the family just make that up? Because then they also tried to resurrect him, which I mean, it's not typically a normal thing to do. But imagine that as a movie. I'd watch it. It's a pretty interesting story for me. Also, if he was possessed, where did the demon go? Like, who's its new host? Because if a host dies, it doesn't necessarily mean that the demon will too. Maybe that could be explored in the movie adaptation. Moving on, at number nine, we have Rig 12. Now, this next story comes from the perspective of a paramedic who was an ambulance driver. It's from the Reddit user Zerbo. Well, they have stated that a lot of paramedics have had a spooky encounter with a haunted ambulance. Maybe it's from somebody who passed away in the back. They don't know. But it's always in the ambulance known as Rig 12. So it was 3 a.m., which bad start already, that's the witching hour. Anyways, him and his partner were both waiting in their ambulance in a small community. That's when they heard a man say, oh my God, am I dying? Then they heard heavy breathing. After that, they heard the oxygen bottle hiss, as if air was being seeped out to help him with his heavy breathing. They thought for sure somebody was in the back of the ambulance, but when they went to investigate, there was nothing there. The oxygen bottle wasn't even touched. Okay, so like a film about a haunted ambulance sounds kinda lame, but imagine a film about the patients that died in the vehicle that keep reliving their deaths and haunting the paramedics. Like, come on, it's not a bad idea. It's, maybe it's not Oscar worthy, but there's definitely some potential with this concept. In our eighth spot, we have Stalker Mom. Now, this story is all about a mom named Karen and her stocking store managers. I would make a pretty good comedy movie. This story was posted from the Reddit user LazyDaisy6702. In September of 2018, when this Reddit user was 16 years old, she went to a new high school and didn't have any friends in the area. That's when she was introduced to a woman named Kat. Now, Kat was 27 years old and they still became good and fast friends despite the age difference. They would see each other fairly often and just hang out. Then it got to a point where Kat would want her to stay over two or more times a week. She would call her every other day and sometimes even call 13 times a day. Kat also gave her a necklace saying, I love you to the moon and back and had a heart attached that said daughter. So she would joke saying that she was like her adopted mom. Then it started getting more darker. At one point, this Reddit user and Kat weren't seeing each other that often. As a result, Kat had a breakdown and tried to kill her other friend. Kat then blamed this user for her own actions. Kat was becoming way too obsessed with her. She even went to her boyfriend and said, you're stealing her away from me. Thankfully, this girl blocked her and they've never had an issue since. Now, this story sounds a lot like the movie The Roommate, but I think that the same director should make a sequel and have it about Kat, and maybe how she likes to befriend younger girls. Maybe she can't have kids of her own, so she likes to play pretend with other girls. Next up at number seven, we have The Watcher. Imagine buying a million dollar home only to find out that it was being stalked by a mystery man, because that's what happened to the next family. They bought a $1.3 million home and claimed it was their perfect dream home. 
minus the creepy stalker part. Now, while living at this home, they received several letters from someone who claimed to be watching the home. Some things that the watcher said in the letters were, this home has been the subject of my family for decades. Now, I'm personally gonna try and decipher this as we go. So, Detective Lindsay on the case. So, I believe this means that his family has some weird tradition of watching over this house, like observing the families and such. I have been put in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. I don't know what that means. I don't think he means it in like a biblical way. And then another letter referred to the new owner's children and asked, have they found out what's in the walls yet? And they never did tear open the walls. I'm curious to know what's in them. Come on people, do some investigating. Anyways, this family ended up moving out of this home and the previous owners admitted that they too were being watched. I could honestly see this being made into a really good thriller mystery. I'm personally already invested in this case. I wish I knew why they were watching this house in particular. Let me know your theories in the comments below. Moving on at number six, we have The Attic. This next story is from the Reddit user DigsDaws. He claims that his one bedroom apartment in Melbourne is haunted. It first started when he came home one day and found the wooden plank that was patching a hole in the ceiling on the ground snapped in two. Above the hole led to a small attic space. Now he claimed that the plank was an inch thick, so it would be hard to break without a decent amount of force applied to it. He thought that maybe someone was in his attic, but that wasn't the case. He called the tenant and she explained that the other two renters experienced the same thing. The board was then replaced. A month later, he woke up to a sound of someone being dragged along the floor of the attic. When he went to investigate, he found that the plank was broken in two again. He also heard children's voices whispering and heard them say, it's your turn, it's your turn, over and over again. He was so freaked out that he just went downstairs and he watched some TV. That was until a fuse blew and then his bird started going crazy. He claims that it sounded like his bird was screaming. In the morning, his bird wasn't in his cage. He found him half drowned in the toilet. Thankfully, the bird survived, so don't worry. But when he talked to the landlord about this, she said, wow, you heard the whispering too? Okay. I think landlords need to include that in their listing. Like, two bedroom apartment, nice kitchen, slightly haunted. <laughs> like, come on. So, I wanna know what happened in that attic space. Clearly something more sinister happened there before he moved in. And I think that's what the movie could focus on. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Hotel Cecil. This hotel is just super cursed. Tons of deaths have occurred in this hotel and it's haunted as a result. So the Hotel Cecil is located in downtown Los Angeles. I suggest not staying there if you are ever visiting. So the first recorded death was in 1931 and it was a suicide. Then all throughout the 30s, 40s, and 60s, there were also similar cases of suicide. They believe that if you stayed at this hotel, then you may be compelled to harm yourself. Then in 1964, a tenant was brutally murdered and the case is still unsolved. Then you have the serial killer, Richard Ramirez, who stayed at this hotel. And finally, you have Eliza Lamb. We've talked about her a bunch, but she's the Canadian woman who was found dead in the hotel's water tank and no one knows why or how she got there. So yeah, this hotel and its gruesome past would form a great movie premise. Moving on to number four, we have the case of Dorothy Jane Scott. This is a real unsolved case of the missing woman named Dorothy Jane Scott. Now before Dorothy disappeared, she would receive phone calls from a mysterious caller. The caller would say things like, when I get you alone, I will cut you up into bits so no one will ever find you. Other times, the caller would profess his love to her. Now, Dorothy did say that she recognized the man's voice, but just couldn't identify who it was. In May of 1980, Dorothy was kidnapped and never seen again. So that night, she was at a work meeting. One of her colleagues started to become sick, so she offered to take him to the hospital. When he was released, Dorothy went to her car to bring it to the front of the hospital. The last thing her colleague saw was her car speeding away. They don't know who was driving it. Later, Dorothy's family started to receive phone calls asking if they were related to her, and it would end by saying, I've got her. They've never found Dorothy or any clues to who this caller may be. Yeah, so they don't know if Dorothy is alive or just being held captive by someone who is obsessed with her. Up next at number three, we have the case of the men in the lead masks. This next case is so fascinating and mysterious, I actually love it. So in 1966 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, two electronics repairmen were found dead. What was strange about this is that they were both found wearing business suits, waterproof coats, and lead eye masks. You know, what people wear when they are going to be exposed to radiation. But then why did they only have the eye pieces and not the full mask? 
I guess that's part of the mystery. Anyways, with them, there was a notebook that read, 4.30 p.m., be at determined place. 6.30 p.m., swallow capsules, wait for mask signal. Now, there are a bunch of theories about this case. Some hypothesize that they had a plot with a nuclear reactor or were part of a doomsday cult. But the most common theory was that they were trying to contact UFOs. In fact, the area that they were in had been getting a lot of reports of UFO sightings. Now, what frustrates me about this case is that there were no toxicology reports done. So, we don't even know what capsules they took or if they died from that or something else. Either way, there needs to be a movie done on this. Maybe they were successful and ended up contacting Protecting aliens, and they were the ones who killed them after they saw too much. Who knows? Coming in at number two, we have my own scary story. Now, I get a lot of comments asking me if I believe in ghosts, and honestly, I don't know what to believe. I've only experienced little tiny things that I end up debunking, partially to make me, you know, be able to sleep at night. All right, so my story. When I was younger, I was a leader for an arts camp. Now, this camp took place in an old house. It was a historic site, and it was used for camps and other activities. But the camp coordinator always said how it was haunted. He claimed that it was once owned by a man. This man ended up faking a robbery in order to get insurance money. He even went as far as to shoot himself in his own leg to make the scene look more realistic. Sadly, he ended up bleeding to death before the cops arrived. Now, people have seen his apparition all throughout the building. There have even been reports of the alarm system being triggered, but when police arrived, no one is there. This has happened several times, and police have even seen this man's face at the window. Now, when I was a leader there, I would deliberately avoid the basement because that was the most haunted space. In the corner where he passed away, it was much warmer than the rest of the basement. Also, the lights down there were motion activated and there were times when they would just turn on by themselves. I personally would feel super uneasy going down to that basement. In fact, there was one time where a group of us were down there filming a video and all of a sudden, two of the staff just felt something at the exact same time and ran upstairs crying. And lastly, this is the freakiest thing of all. In one of the rooms in the basement, the camp coordinator said that the ghost likes to stay in there. It's a room behind a thick, heavy locked door. When he opened it, there was just a single chair in the middle of the room. This is the spot that he likes to sit. You could knock over that chair or move it, and it would just always end up in the same spot. Now, when I saw that chair, I felt like he was sitting right there watching us. Like, it was a really weird feeling. I just knew he was there. So, uh, yeah, a haunted camp, a man who accidentally killed himself to try and take his insurance money. All good basis for a movie plot. And in our number one spot, we have the Utah murder-suicide. Now, this story is very disturbing. In September of 2014, Utah teen Jason McGee entered his home and found his parents, Benjamin and Christy Strack, and his three younger siblings dead. At first, police did not know why the parents would kill themselves and their children. Later, they discovered the creepy truth. So, when Jansen came home, all he found was a to-do list for him. It said things like feed the pets, watch over the house. But that was the only thing left for him. There was no suicide note, nothing. When he went upstairs to the master bedroom, him and his grandmother found his family's body spread across the floor. After investigation, police found that the parents were convinced that there was an oncoming apocalypse and wanted to escape this evil before it happened. They also found that the mother, Christy Strack, was in contact with Dan Laferty, a killer who murdered his sister-in-law and her daughter. Apparently, they became good friends after exchanging numerous letters. Christy and Benjamin would both even visit him in prison. Police think that Dan also had a big influence on them and pushed them to harm themselves. What's sad is how the kids didn't really have a choice and how they were convinced that this was the right thing to do. The one 14 year old even wrote a letter to his friend saying that his toys can go to him when he's gone. Police believe that Jansen was spared since he was engaged and independent from his family. All right, everyone, that's it for today's video. Let me know in the comments below which story you would want to see made into a movie. And as always, don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe to Most Amazing Top 10 for more amazing videos. I've been your host, Lindsay Ivan, and I'll see you when I see you.